Thanks for having us. I am John Baraka, VP Partnerships with Media.net. By way of quick introduction, Media.net is an ad exchange that uh, connects premium publisher, Comscore top 100 publishers directly with brands and advertisers to transact programmatically. And we enrich uh, our programmatic transactions with search informed contextual data. So um, exciting topic. Uh, this is a topic that um, I heard talked about on a lot of panels yesterday, and it's really about the times that we're in. So we have uh, the year that we're in now, the year ahead. Um, there's a lot of uncertainty is maybe a, a term we can use. So really how um, the discussion around how we can drive impact uh, during change and uncertain times. So um, with that, Super excited to be joined by um, some of the greatest minds in the industry to talk about this. Um, Jeff and Alexa, would you mind just maybe introducing yourselves and some of your experience in the space? Hi, I'm Alexa Kristen. I am the former head of media for GE, CMO for Pearson, and currently I am a consultant um, for CMOs and boards, mostly legacy companies making big transitions. Hi, I'm Jeff Liang. Um, I'm at the Essence Media Comp side of things, so my office is very close, three floors down, um, <laughs> so not much of a commute. Um, <clears throat> but I've been on the agency side for uh, pretty much all my career, focused in on digital. So I lead, you know, digital products and services across uh, our Essence Media Comp clients. Cool. Thanks. So um, I'm just going to tee up this conversation, um, really, with you know, we're talking about change and uncertainty. So. There's been a lot of things that have happened in our in our industry and outside of our industry that affects change, and that means you know how we operate as organizations, how we align to what's happening around us. Um, but we've seen things. We've seen a lot of tech layoffs. Big tech layoffs have been a very significant thing that's happened over the last six months, even longer. Um, we've seen agencies go through consolidation. Um, which has led to a lot of our, our peers and our friends um, in, in pretty tough situations of looking for work. Uh, a lot of this has been the result of things happening in the economy around us. So uh, recently, Silicon Valley Bank um, going back or even currently happening now, there's, there's a war going on in Ukraine that's affecting all types of things around the world. Um, there is a global pandemic, which feels like ages ago, but that is, is still pretty recent. Um, so all of these external factors are impacting our industry. So um, I, a lot of that, I think, has led to somewhat of a negative perception on what's happening within the advertising industry, that like maybe the ad industry is hurting, budgets are being halted. Um, but the reality is that's not the case. Um, things are not all doom and gloom. Um, the ad industry, U.S. media spend is projected to grow this year 3.6%, according to a study from Magna that was pretty recent just last month. Uh, if you exclude the Olympics, the World Cup, uh, political budgets from last year, our industry is expected to grow, spend is expected to grow 5.5%, 6%. Um, that's growth. Uh, so we are still growing as an industry and, and growing at probably a much faster clip than a lot of other industries that are out there. So that's great. Um, but I think there's an overarching theme that change happens. It happens, you know, it's happening right now in our world. It's happened before. It'll happen again. So really, how do we need to structure ourselves as, as organizations to be able to uh, handle times of uncertainty? So that's kind of what I want to dive into. Alexa, I'd love to start with you. Um, you know, what I guess we can call this, I, I kind of call it like a time of economic turbulence. But how, you know, as a brand, um, or how should brands be thinking about, you know, not only advertising budgets during times of uncertainty, but also um, ways that you're you're continuing to be able to connect with consumers uh, during the, these times. I, we talked about this like when we were prepping, and I think this is such an awesome tie. We went from 2020 global pandemic, cash was free basically, right? Investments were in fuego, is what I like to say. Everything was on fire, and what all of a sudden now we're in this place where 
Money is expensive. Investments feel like they're light, but there is still a ton of innovation and opportunity, and we're seeing it in the growth. So I think what brands are doing, they're marking to market, if you know, that's like a financial term, right? They're getting down to, we were inflated, maybe our budgets were too high, or maybe we were putting money in the wrong places. I go back to what Mike was saying on the previous panel, which I thought was so smart. He was like, know your audience, get in the details. I think brands are starting to do that and really understanding where that spend is. And I work with a lot of CMOs and C-level executives in, in lots of different companies. The question is not, I need to be efficient and I need to drive my top line, period, full stop. The question is, I need to do that and I need to own certain spaces. I still need innovation. If I don't have that, I don't have anything. Because as we know, it's really a race to the bottom if you're only focused on part of your funnel. Yeah, you know, I kind of agree with you because uh, the economic data that, that you're seeing nowadays kind of contradicts what's happening in the marketplace, right? There's obviously a lot of fear, but if you look at consumer spending, it's it's it continues to be strong as ever. Um, again, GDP numbers show that we're actually in growth, not, not necessarily a uh, recession. So there's a lot of fear that's going on, which is actually reducing our, you know, ad spend across the board. But I kind of like to take a contrarian perspective on this. You know, um, when everyone's fearful, maybe there is an opportunity to actually uh, gain market share. So um, the way I kind of look at this is if you, uh, I'm gonna, we're talking to the market, so I'll kind of quote Warren Buffett's uh, uh, very famous quote here. Um, you know, again, it's, it's, you know, when others are greedy, be fearful. When others are fearful, be greedy. And we're at a time where perhaps this is an opportunity when your competitors are reducing your spend. Uh, maybe there's a way for us to leverage that spend currently or increase that spend to gain market share. It, you're in an environment where, you know, the competition is actually reducing spend. You know, that's sort of a dream for of our brands to take market share. So I, I really think that we have to look at it as potentially there is an opportunity, but obviously do your research because in certain verticals, we're not seeing that growth. But in many verticals, uh, we are seeing that growth, you know, coming out of the pandemic, um, you know, back in 1918, you know, we, we were known going through an era after post pandemic as the roaring 20s. And this is when people are, you know, have survived a very serious situation and they want to go out and spend. And I think that's what we're seeing today. Consumers want to be out there. They want to travel. They want to be able to spend. They want to live life. And I think it's a, it really could be seen as an opportunity to try to not follow that herd mentality of, you know what, the easiest thing is to reduce spend, but maybe there's an opportunity here that we can actually capitalize on. So, uh, Jeff, so staying right here, so do you think, um, so what, what are some of those things? Like at, at an agency, um, how, how, what are some of the things that you need to do organizationally to weather times of ups and downs? Is it more focus on team structures? Is it more focus on support um, systems for your brands? Is there more focus on product um, to fit sort of the changing times? Yeah, you know, what's interesting the last three years is that it has really created a significant shift in how consumers, you know, use media. You know, we've seen people um, starting to be on their phones a lot more. We've seen e-commerce increase significantly. You know, people are now moving from linear to connected TV. And um, this is what we call media fragmentation that's happening in the marketplace. And within media fragmentation, it's so important to really understand how to reach those consumers. And that's why you have sort of a proliferation of data, technology, and tools to actually access these folks. And, and, and I think what's really important for us uh, as an agency is to understand you know what's available to us how do we actually reach this consumer in modern times today you know they're not just watching you know tv and we're not able to just reach them with 15 30 second commercials they're on you know things like social media influencer marketing has become a really big thing you know especially with some of the younger audiences so uh, i think uh, an, an examination of where we are where we're placing our media is is really critical for all of our brands Yep, uh, agreed. And and I think um, what you mentioned before, consumer behavior is shifting in a, in a big way, right? Like, think about what the retail world looked like pre-pandemic versus now. It's a it's a totally different animal, right? So, um, Alexa, I, I think 
I guess the question that I have for you is more around, you know, how are we reaching consumers now um, in specific industries, and especially where where there's a focus on uh, efficiency um, to some extent with what's going on in the economy. Um, is there more of a focus on the mid to lower funnel um, versus maybe, you know, where branding and awareness was a big part of, of ad budgets maybe prior to this state that we're in now, but, you know, are you trying to really find more ways to directly correlate sales um, and, and return on ad spend um, for investments put in? I think, I think especially CMOs are starting to really look at, again, that detail of the makeup. It is not like a, we have to only, we always have to only focus on mid and lower funnel. And as we know, if you do, you're in trouble, right? So it's not a formula. I think what's happening is, and this is kind of back to the first question, is that we are, and, and I think that there's so much pressure from the CFO on the CMO and the marketing department to really shore up that growth. That's not going to go away, but how it interacts, how we get really smart about when we turn things on. Like, again, Danone was a great example, and I have to go back to the Danone example around Silk, like really driving that top funnel awareness all the way through and driving value all the way through from that brand into mid and lower funnel. So I think mid and lower funnel is, this is a art and science, but I think we will see that mid and lower funnel from a business imperative perspective, the board, the C-level executives are going to ask for that no matter what, but we will lose the value of it if we don't have real kind of smart brand placement and spend. Yeah, and just to add that real quick, I, th I think, you know, in today's times, financial restrictions and limitations are definitely, um, you know, prioritized. And um, I think that most of, you know, most brands are starting to move their budgets into lower funnel, mid funnel, because that's where you show results. It's much easier to show, you know, a positive KPI there. But, you know, we know that upper funnel, um, through studies that's been proven, it actually creates that demand. It generates that demand for your product and services. And you can only neglect it for so long before that actually starts to affect middle and bottom funnel, right? Bottom funnel is to, to capture that demand. So I really think that there's got to be a proper balance of the two and the limitations of, you know, how much you can switch and how long you can switch, um, you know, is definitely there. It has to be considered. Yeah, I, I agree. This is a perfect segue, I think, into shifting into more of, of strategy, right? So, um, you know, there's shifts in the economy that are forcing us to do organizationally different things or, ad or adapt to kind of the current state of, of where we are in the economy. Um, but then there's also change happening within our industry, right? Within um, big tech, as far as like cookie deprecation is, is a big topic right now. Um, I don't even like to say cookie deprecation because I feel like I actually I know the cookies were mostly deprecated about three years ago um, with Apple and, and ITT and Safari. Um, but right now, there is only something roughly around 30 percent of the open web is addressable, and that's via a Chrome, a Chrome browser or, or a Google device. Right. So um, the the addressable world is shrinking. Um, focusing on the mid to lower funnel is getting more difficult because it's getting harder to track conversions to some extent. So I guess um, over to Jeff, what types of strategies are being tested, deployed, and potentially even scalable now in the age of, of what we're seeing as far as, um, as, far as um, you know, cookies or just identifying users can, can, can go? Yeah, I mean, we've been uh, dealing with the cookie deprecation for, for over two, three years now. And... Um, you know, what's happening in the federal uh, legislation is causing a lot of confusion, obviously, because, frankly speaking, there, there is much uh, regulation. You know, every time we have a congressional testimony here, it's always sort of the, the biggest producer of Internet memes for our industry. You know, so so it, I think, um, you know, the states now are taking, you know, protecting user privacy into their own hands by creating state legislation, which is even more confusing and difficult to navigate. And so um, I think what we're trying to do is, you know, obviously figure out what would be best for our clients. And, and one of the things that we know will happen in, in when, cook the, when the cookie eventually deprecates is that you will 
um, have some uh, sort of a step back in terms of the ability to utilize third party data. And the only data that you really will be able to have there is first party data, right? So, so that's something that you own and something that I think, you know, what we recommend is that, you know, we have to be proactive in managing your first party data. It is something that will become more valuable over time. And uh, to start procuring that data to practically manage it and gather and collect that uh, is going to be an asset for you in the future. Uh, given that we don't know exactly what's going to happen yet, you know, I don't think it's just and you know doom and gloom once uh, the cookie deprecates because I do think you know Google will come up with a solution that will hopefully um, be something that the industry can adjust to. I mean, their their current appro approach is being very open about what they're working on. They're trying to get feedback from the industry. So I think it's not the end of the world. I think it's going to be a, a period of adjustment for um, all of the industry players to actually adopt to that new way of targeting. Um, but, you know, again, that's that's the best thing to do right now is to really proactively manage first party data. Can I right. add? Can yeah, I add? Yeah, go ahead. I think we are moving to a world of ownership, like, right, customer ownership, consumer ownership. What relationship do I want want you to have with me? I own that. We know that brands and I'm doubling down on what Jeff said because brands owning and understanding and actually driving analytics off of their first party data, not just in a media setting. Media setting actually contributes to all of this knowledge, but really owning that first party data, understanding it starts to become a massive intellectual property for a brand. And as we move into the world of partnerships, and I think we might talk about that a little bit, that is probably one of the most valuable pieces of, of a brand's IP in terms of who their customers are, what they understand about them, but also where they activate. It is like a huge new world, I think, in terms of how we've, we've talked about first-party data for a long time. I don't think what we've talked about is actually what that means in kind of this ownership world. Yep, agreed too. And I think as an industry, we, we've we've done a good job at at least um, knowing who our consumers are. At least from you know capturing uh, who I want to reach. Um, that that has always been there. Now the shift is, you know, how can I reach them, right? And there's there's different, like I, I just talked about cookie deprecation, but you went into like there's more, like there's privacy compliance um, regulation being launched around the world. GDPR is already there. Um, CCPA, every state is doing something different. So as far as other strategies that can be deployed, um, where does um, contextual fit into this because I think a lot we a lot of what we talk about is reaching our own consumers. Um, we probably got into a bit of trouble as an industry just by going heavier on finding users and not going as much into context of you know where am I reaching this consumer as much as just reaching that consumer as as we may have you know had done you know maybe a decade ago before we got very heavy into programmatic. So uh, maybe this is uh, Jeff or Alexa can take this one. But um, but is there? Do you see like a, a a renaissance, if you will, of contextual coming back, and then leveraging that as a strategy to either um, help drive better business outcomes of reaching the right person in the right state of mind, um, or even complement some of the um, the challenges that we're seeing in the industry of just reaching a consumer in general? Yeah, you know, I I don't think contextual ever went away. You know, it was actually you know being in advertising for so long, it was actually the first way of uh, using content, um, because when I heard content is king, you know that that was the old way of uh, of targeting. And I think going back to that isn't necessarily a bad thing. But but also, you know, because of what's happening with the data and privacy space, there are a lot of folks working on alternative solutions. You know, we, we've been working on um, a technology where we look at site log behavior and gathering and bucketing them into cohorts. Uh, and that's considered to be contextual targeting. It's not based on, you know, cookie IDs. So there are definitely alternatives that are being worked on that could be successful. I and mean, we've actually, you know, not only is it helpful for targeting purposes, but also for uh, researching consumer behaviors and, and you're targeting what they're doing online and what, what sites would they like to visit. So, you know, I, I think that, you know, uh, content and contextual will never go away. As a matter of fact, you know, if you look at what consumers are doing these days as they move to channels like, 
connected TV. Uh, the limitations are there. You know, we can't actually utilize those mediums just like the internet, like mobile uh, banner ads, et cetera. Uh, we may have to think about how do we actually weave the brand into uh, contextual placements. And I, I've seen, you know, ads that you could place um, over content nowadays. You could actually use gaming technology to uh, essentially create, you know, a logo onto somebody's coffee cup in, a, in, in gaming or, or actually in videos. Um, and so I think there are different ways that we can reach our consumers uh, and not necessarily just rely on, again, third party data. I want to argue with him, but he's he's right. Um, I, I want to like shake it up and debate, but you're right. Um, to, just to add to that, what I what I'm looking at is how contextual starts to execute an experience, and like real physical experience, real digital experience. I mean, we've gone into this brave world of talking about the metaverse and NFTs and all of those things. It's just a new environment. So I think if we can start to really build contextual opportunities for brands in these new environments, that's how, where I see this accelerating. And there also lies in a big aha in connecting the product and the consumer experience. So I think that's where hopefully we're headed. Maybe we're going to be back here in 10 years and I'll be saying the same thing. I don't know. <laughs> Quite possibly. But wait, Alexa, staying, staying there for a minute. So, um, so do you think just with everything we just talked about, it's, it's harder to reach consumers. There's different strategies that we're deploying. Is there, um, do, or do you envision like a fundamental shift in how we think about KPIs? So like there's, it's harder to track conversions, um, you know, is is cohort based reach, you know, just like we do in TV, something that might be coming more into digital and, and programmatic um, as everything evolves within the ecosystem? I'm going to answer that two ways. I think conversion right now is a standard KPI. Right. And we're not going to move away from some of those standard KPIs. I would love us to move away from some of the standard KPIs that we have as an industry. I think we all would. Right. Because it is a hard argument to your clients and it's a hard argument for your clients to make to their teams and executives on the kind of impact they're having. The second part of that is, yes, I think there are going to be some fundamental shifts. Again, when we start to think about fandom, how do you start to look at super fans? What kind of conversion? What's a metric for a super fan? Is it that they're going to wear your t-shirt out? Is that right? When you think about that, are they going to tell your friends to go to that, that you have, they have to go to that restaurant? I think like, and those are probably weaker examples, but we have to start looking, I think, as an industry, as things start to get more complex, actually simplifying what those KPIs are at a business level, right? So looking at how are we actually driving that repeat use or the time spent in game or the this or the that, or even driving a, a kind of new cohort for partners and kind of co collaborations. Those are things that I think won't be kind of spot initiatives, but will become standard in a lot of plans and for a lot of marketers will become standard um, things that we have to measure in a different way. Yeah, and, and I, I just want to emphasize what you said. Um, it's so important that KPIs really focus in on business impact. Um, you know, having been in digital forever, I, I think everyone knows our digital measuring measurement ecosystem is flawed in many ways, right? You know, we have, you know, I've seen over 100 plus, you know, KPIs and metrics like cost per conversion, you know, uh, viewability, you know, cost per view, et cetera. And um, at the end of the day, um, there really needs to be a look at what these KPIs are actually doing driving the, the bottom line. You know, is it driving sales for us? Is it contributing to those sales? And that's sort of the, the, the most difficult part of um, connecting that, you know, the KPIs to business impact. And, and, you know, what we try to do is focus on, you know, doing regression analysis and correlate uh, those KPIs to the actual business uh, impact, whether it's sales or registrations, et cetera. Um, and, and that part is 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 extremely important because uh, it is a race to the bottom in many cases when you only focus on those KPIs. And in many ways, you know, these KPIs can be easily manipulated. And we've seen that in the past. So 
um, there really needs to be a focus on you know the bottom line and 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 the business first, and then think about what KPIs correlate to that to that actual business impact. Yep, absolutely, and 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 this is another good segue, shifting gears a bit into into partnerships, right? So there's a lot of things happening in our space. Again, there's change in how we need to operate as an organization to um, possibly do more with with less. Um, there's different things in the industry that are happening that require probably expertise or partnerships to um, help navigate, uh, help brands, help help agencies, help each other um, just navigate changing times. So, um, I guess some some examples, you know, um, from our pr perspective as an, an exchange and an S S SP, um, we sit close to publishers and supply. So, um, you know, working with partners to help optimize on their behalf. Um, of parts of the supply chain that might not be visible from the buy side. But um, Jeff, how would you leverage some of your ad tech partnerships in times like these changes in the in the economy, changes in the in industry for either efficiency, expertise, or both? Yeah, you know, I think we talked about, um, you know, the uncertain times of today. And if, if I compare what's happening today to the last recession, 2008, is that there is now a vast number of data technology providers and platforms that we could actually deploy uh, for our brands that never existed before. And the amount of um, these players are, again, quite overwhelming. And um, it's actually difficult to understand what they do. Um, you know, on the agency side, we've really taken that on as something that we really need to understand and, and explore and evaluate and assess for our clients. Um, and and it's again, you know, not every player is going to make sense for for the brands. A lot of times, it depends on the right the objectives and what we're trying to do. Um, but when when actually deployed properly, it could yield a significant amount of benefit for our clients. And so um, we take the consultative approach of really getting to understand what these uh, tools and capabilities can do, and then we actually you know make the right recommendations. So so that's that's sort of how we're taking that approach. I wish more brands were in here because I'm going to answer this question. There are so many. I talk to so many of my agency partners who tell me that their CMO and their teams aren't trusting them. And it happens way too much. And they're, these people are experts at what they do. You know, so I think there is a big push um, that needs to happen in the relationship side that and whether it's agencies or other partners where uh CMOs, marketing teams are getting to know what their partners do really, really well and really having an intimate relationship with them so that Jeff and team can come in and be consultative so that it's not just uh, we put it on a buy. We're just doing this because it's what you've done before. Because right now is a dynamic time in the world and in business. And if we just kind of, from a marketing perspective, <clears throat> if we're just filling the, the lines on a spreadsheet, we're not doing our job, and we're being custodians or custodial versus actually driving something forward. And I think that's for both of us. That's for the agency side and the partner side, as well as the marketer and client side. Yeah, and just one last point on that is, uh, you know, I really do believe in today's times, the best partnerships I've seen is to create a win-win-win situation between the brand, the agency, and and the partner. And and uh, it is something that we could all work on together because there's more than enough complexities for us to navigate in this marketplace. And um, typically, those types of partnerships really, again, yield a ton of benefit for our brands. Yep, absolutely. You you said the title of the uh, of the of the conference. We're navigating through um, through changing times, but navigating through the the industry and the ecosystem. There's a lot of moving pieces, right? So how how important is it for just you know old fashioned communication um, across the the supply chain and all of the constituents within that um, to work together to work towards solving problems? That's really what we're here for at the end of the day, right? So um, how are we with time? Questions? Should we open it up? Sure. Any questions? Thanks, guys. This was good. Um, at the beginning of this, you had talked about growth inside of our industry. And 
you know, I, I guess I was just, and I don't expect you to have the data on you, but um, it certainly feels to me like the cycles are longer this year and the buys are more deliberate inside of intentionality or more seasonality or wherever the consumer base for them it acts, the, you know, there's just a lot more subsections of the buy than there was maybe 18 months ago, it feels like. So I guess I'm just wondering, um, and you know, other my other friends in the media all are kind of feeling the same pain, maybe not the same Q1 growth as we normally see, whatever, whatever, right? So anyway, I just say all this because I just was wondering if you could knew or, or had a rough idea of exactly where the growth is coming from because I think, uh, like, internally, I don't think we feel <laughs> like we're in a growth year necessarily on the on the buy side. So, yeah, it's a fair question, and feel free to chime in. But um, I think a lot of it, um, and this this reference was from the Magna Annual sure, U.S. Sure, media sure. spend study, and there's probably similar um, reports out there. Um, but that I th there are a lot more shifts in specific industries. Uh, and brands, uh, you know, within those industries. And a lot of that has to do with the consumer behavior shift that we've seen with not only like pandemic was like the obvious one of how consumers just shifted their buying behavior. But now in times of, you know, inflation and cost of everything is high. So certain industries within them as well. Um, I will say one other part of that study that I think just puts this a little bit more in relative terms um, in 2008 which was the last big recession that we had as an economy before whatever you know you want to call this of what we're in now um u.s media spend uh decreased by about 10 to 15 percent so um even if it's not in a full growth mode as we're used to in years past relatively speaking um it's much different times now um compared to what we were as an industry then and if you want to add go ahead yeah and, and that's why i talked about in terms of what the perception and the reality, because if you actually look at all the data, um, we're, we're in modest growth. I mean, it's not certainly not strong growth, but um, in a lot of the categories and verticals, they're, they're seeing growth like retail and travel, but in some areas they're, they're hurting, you know, financials, et cetera. Um, but it's this perception of doom and gloom and it's, it's pulling back that I think we as marketers have to confront. And, you know, again, it's easier to pull back and do what everyone else is doing. But I think, you know, we need to be bold. You know, we're, we're, we as marketers, we're not here to preserve the brands. We're here to grow the brands. So I do think there's an opportunity to, to look at the research, you know, look at the data a little bit harder and make those comparisons and make the case for, um, you know, potentially increasing our spend during these times. So I was like head nodding fervently. I think, what did you say, like methodical planning or what, right? Yeah, more deliberate, yeah. The intentional <laughs> direct targeting, just really trying to. There is, the there is, and that's what I was talking about earlier, where so the, the kind of mid, what I would say mid and lower funnel especially is methodical planning, very deliberate. And I would say even upper funnel has become, we're not going to do it all. We're going to do a few things and it's going to be very well thought out and rationalized from a business impact standpoint. That's what's happening. I don't think that's a bad thing. It may be, it may feel like slower growth, but I also think there's an opera. I don't know what you do. Where, where do you work? I'm the CEO of All City Network. We have oh. digital sports networks in different cities. Oh, well, that's got to be in fuego, actually. That's got to be on fire right yeah. now. Sports is about to well, like. I, I was going to follow up. So I, I yeah. think, like, to speak to some of the growth, we are seeing brands that we wouldn't necessarily partner with before leave spaces that they were spending a lot of money in and, you know, coming over to us and doing buys like we talked about, yeah. more intentional, maybe yep. test buys first or whatever. And so there is stuff there, but I think the overall, that big buy, let's throw, you know. Because I have all this excess cash and I've got to yeah. go out and diversify and do all these things. That is not happening as much. That's right. It so, is not happening as much. So are yeah. you guys seeing the money spread across more categories and then more testing and stuff like that? I mean, is that where the growth is? I'm actually not seeing it spread across more categories. I'm seeing it actually consolidated where it works. This is what that, and that's what's interesting. Why I think you see new in entrants is because there were things that didn't work for them. So it's, a, it's, a it's a really interesting thing that's actually happening, I think. 
Yeah, and I, I think it's more of a reallocation of to, to places where it's working. You know, I think when IDFA occurred, it impacted social so much. They, you know, advertisers lost the ability to target and measure, and we saw some brands move you know, 50% of their social budget into other areas like programmatic and search where it's not affected. So in these times, absolutely, there's a lot of reallocation to areas that works and areas that's not as impacted and, and areas where consumers are starting to, to head to. Um, so yeah, there's it's more of a reallocation consolidation too. I would say in your space, sorry, we're like loving this question, but in your space specifically, if you're in sports and local sports and it's digital, I think there is a lot of conversation about what's happening in the future of sports and where people, again, can start getting ownership positions, even in what I would call non-national or sub-sports. It's not the NFL. It's something else. It's lacrosse. It's not this. It's that. But it's, again, about where am I going to reach the audience I need to reach and how can I do that in a in a way that it's not going to cost me the Super Bowl. It's going to actually put me on the ground with the fans, with my audience, and I'm going to have a more meaningful position. I, that is that is a conversation that is happening, especially in digital sports. Hi, just to um, uh, add on to what you were saying, you were using a lot of words that were like very methodical, specific, safe is what comes to mind. Um, what would be your recommendation? I'm sure a lot of people in this room and certainly in the industry represent uh, innovative new startup types of things. What would be your, uh, especially on the sales side, I'm on the sales side, uh, what would be your recommendation for how do they get into, whether it's uh, in with you, Jeff, or into the client, um, because they represent things that aren't tested? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you want it, You want me to take that? Or you, I'll take it first. I'm, I, my background is more in media innovation, so I'm all about the new and the first and those types of things. I would, by the way, I wouldn't say safe. I would actually say trusted, tested, and responsible. A couple of things. This is, it comes down to budget. It comes down to, are you walking in and asking for a big check on something that's unknown? It comes down to knowing, I, I, I truly believe my best partners, even ones I had just been introduced to, were ones who knew my business really, really well, but came to the table to really have a conversation with me about what was possible and what your vision was, where those, where you, what you do and what you can bring to the table actually maximizes what I'm trying to do. That is, it is so important to not, and I also think if you're, if you're really selling innovation, innovation is not one size fits all. So that's why it's really a conversation. Well, we were, we were talking again, when we were prepping about this, Instead of asking to um, talk to the CRO in many cases or talk to the sales team, I would sit down and say, I want to talk to the chief product officer if there was one. I want to understand what are you building and what's the roadmap and where could I actually maybe fit in with some new ideas. And I think that's part of the conversation. So maybe even bringing some people to the conversation that typically don't have a seat at the table, but maybe should, especially in the kind of changing, changing times. I don't, I'm sure. I think we're, we're out of time, but I'll go with what she says. <laughs> <laughs> that was easy. All right. All right. Well, sorry. Great. <laughs> yeah, we'll be around. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Thank you.